without the further ado, a guy who is welcome to the guy. My story is pretty straightforward. I was shot down by the people we've been attacking in late December of 67. I had been over there at that time about 10 and a half months. I had about 400 combat missions. And uh, in the F-100 fighter, I was shot down two times. First time we were rescued just offshore by very brave men of the U.S. Search and Rescue Forces helicopter personnel, who we call the bravest men in the world because we go into North Vietnam at uh, four, five, six hundred, twenty five, five fifty 550 miles an hour, turn them constantly because it was extremely heavy fire. And uh, we'd get shot down at those speeds. And these guys would come in on helicopters 150 miles an hour, driven by driving a bus, and they couldn't turn hard. And they'd always come in on twos right on the deck because so many times one or two would get shot down trying to pick up us, so we call them the bravest men in the world. We men. But at any rate, I'd like to talk to you tonight about the, some of the conditions of prison camp, give you an idea of uh, what happened to me up there and uh, what it was like. Uh, to give you an idea, overall, six out of seven men were tortured to death or killed by the Russians and the North Vietnamese in one way or the other of the men who were not the who weren't rescued. Okay. We had 3,570 men. Ever I shot down, not rescued, and 473 came back. The rest of them over those years were killed. Now, the only thing that got me through was a uh, very heavy prayer. And uh, I didn't know enough to pray when I first got up there. But I, I learned after I almost committed suicide because of the hatred that developed in my heart when they beat my friends to death and torture me to death and uh, torture me and beat me badly and all this kind of stuff. So it took me many months to understand that you're, you're not allowed to hate. And uh, the way you have to be is forgiving and you have to conquer uh, hatred with love rather than get all upset and everything like that. It took me a long time to see that. And uh, before I saw it, I had terrible thoughts of suicide coming outside my mind, telling me to stop eating and die in the corner so that they couldn't get a propaganda from me on television when you see interviews with POWs on the prison camp being traitors to their country. That's what they were trying to do. That was constantly with torture. But first of all, the way it was in prison camp, you're in a cell. The cell's going to be anywhere from five feet by six feet up to about 10 by 12 or so. Uh, your cells are concrete floors, concrete walls. The walls are this thick. There's a tin roof on them. And uh, you have no windows, no doors. Uh, I tell people uh, one of the biggest shocks to you is you're locked in this cell. Of course, there's no television in the cell, there's no radio in the cell, there's no books in the cell. There's no nothing in the cell. Your clothes are two pair of pajamas, you know, peasant pajamas. Uh, you've got sandals. You've got no socks. In the wintertime, it's that in the 30s and the 40s. Uh, no socks, two pair of pajamas, one blanket. You shiver for weeks at a time, 24 hours a day. No way to get warm. In the summertime, you've got a tin roof, uh, cell with no circulation at all. The temperatures get up probably 160, 180 degrees. You spend your days laying on the concrete, breathing the air under the crack in the door of the cell, getting, trying to get 100 degree air in your lungs. That's how you spend your days. You've got bleeding heat rash all over your body by May, and then the summer starts. Heat rash only gets worse during the summer. In the summertime, the heat is so bad, you're praying to, Lord, please make it cold. And I'll never complain about the cold again. Then in the wintertime, you're praying, Lord, if you make it hot, I'll never complain about the heat again. 
and your prayer switches every six months. Real heat like that and real cold are beyond experience, you know, in normal living, but you, you get the, that, those kind of conditions. You have uh, boards across sole horses for your bed. You're sleeping on boards, three boards across the sole horse. Um, again, you have one blanket, you have a little cup, a tin cup, and you have a little uh, one liter, one liter uh, ceramic container. You get that ceramic container filled with water twice a day. They open the cell door at 11 o'clock and they have a pot of water and you ladle the water into your uh, uh, one liter pot. You do that again at four in the afternoon. You have a loaf of bread this big. A loaf of bread is like a French loaf of bread, but it's real small. It's not enough to satisfy your hunger in any way, shape, or form. For the first year and a half or two years, we had hunger pains up there until we lost, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 pounds. We're down into, I was 190, 195, and probably went down to 130, 120, whatever. But, and then at that point in time, hunger pains greatly decreased. They, as you lose the weight, the little loaf of bread becomes more able to support your weight. Okay, so the hunger pains come down. It takes a long time to happen. All you do is you drink the food all, all night long, and the body's trying to tell you, hey, you're dying here, you gotta, you gotta eat something. So, of course, there's no way you can get any food. The bread is full of uh, rat droppings. It's uh, all bamboo construction over there. They don't have anything like our kitchen cabinets. Uh, no way to protect the flour. Um, I, I did a lot of reading on Vietnam at the Air Force Academy before I went over to Vietnam, and they said they lost 30% of their food to rats. Okay. I believe they lost a lot more than 30% to rats. You know, imagine food unprotected all night. You know, really, the rats go through bamboo like it's not even there. So at any rate, you had endless rat droppings in this bread. I'm not talking about one or two droppings in the loaf. I'm talking about a rat dropping in every cubic centimeter where you can't pick the droppings out. There's almost as many droppings as there was flour. And I really, honestly, didn't mind it because I knew there wasn't any way we were getting the nutrition to live out of the flour. The only hope was there's something good in those rat droppings. But at any rate, there was also all kinds of living things in the bread. Worms, weevils, you read about the ships where they had weevils in the bread and so on. So we had, we had living things. Some of these worms were big and alive, and you bite into them, they bite your mouth. You have to bite, kill the worm, and swallow it. There's all kinds of worms in the water. Dead, they boil the water. There's all kinds of worms in the water. Uh, you know, in a typical little cup there, you can just barely see it. You'd have hundreds and hundreds of dead worms in your uh, cup. Okay, that's your food, that's your water. Uh, no seasoning on the bread, no butter on the bread, no no uh, joy there, no pleasure, no anything like you lived in this country. It was a total shock. Uh, I tell people the greatest shock was really going from the typical American 100 miles an hour, no time to say hi to anybody, no time to do anything except one entertainment, one job after another. From the time you wake up to the time you're going to sleep, you know, you're entertained or doing something to absolute dead still in a cell. And I say, if you really want to know what that's like, <laughs> just go into a bathroom on Saturday morning, don't take anything in that bathroom, and try to sit there for, ten, for six hours, till three in the afternoon. That's easy, six hours, right? Don't let there be anything in there. You can't look out the window. Nothing, nothing at all in there, no music, no nothing. And just stay there. Living with your own mind, living with your own thoughts only for six hours. And we had to do that 24 7 for year after year after year. And you can do it pretty well after a year. It takes you a year to be able to do that. It also teaches you the value of. Uh, silence and being alone and so on. There's a lot that comes from that. Being able to live with yourself with nothing else on earth. You know, where you're just contained 
and yourself. So that was very interesting. After three months up there, after they had, you know, beat my one of my class, one of my classmates, one of my squadron mates from the Air Force Academy to death over 40 days, they beat us up. I was with another guy in the cell, Bob Kramer, and uh, the two of us had been beaten, tortured, and so on, all this kind of stuff. Um, interrogated constantly, three and four hours a day, a week at least. And when they take you to the interrogations, they would, you know, hit their wrist like this with which meant put on your long sleeve pajamas. You had a pair of long sleeve pajamas and a pair of short sleeve pajamas. The long sleeve pajamas, that's like formal, that's like being dressed in a suit or a sport coat. Means you're going to meet the interrogator. See? So you go to the interrogator and you're interrogated, you come back in. If you're not tortured, you come back in to the cell and so on and so forth. That happens a number of times every week. But other than that, there's no break in a routine. Once a week, you're, they bring you out to a little uh, four by five room that has a, a little vat of water in it, and you are able to take a bucket and wash yourself. You're not allowed to, you don't have any water to wash yourself during the week. You're thirsty all the time, winter and summer. In the summertime, the thirst, hunger is bad, hunger pains are bad. It's constant pain. But thirst pains are much worse. And you're thirsty all summer long because you only got two pints of water a day. And especially when you were first over there where you're a big American, you know, and your body just is screaming, screaming for water. Uh, because of the fact you have two liters a day, if you have any uh, dirty hands or anything, you can't wash the hands. If you have no water, you take every ounce of water you can and, and drinking it. So you don't have, you have, they say they give you toilet paper. They give you a piece of eight and a half by eleven brown paper with a knot still on it. Okay, that's your toilet paper. So it's not enough. I had diarrhea for the first two and a half years. So you can't, your, your bathroom is a bucket in the cell. You empty the bucket quarter to six in the morning. They knock on your door, you put the bucket out, and then they close the door. And they do the next thing to the next cell. Fifty cells in this camp. And then they have uh, one room come and collect all the buckets and dump them in the French latrine, and then they put the buckets back, and then you, they open your door and you take them in. And most, everybody's isolated. They don't let any cell talk to another. They want you isolated so they can break you better for interrogations and propaganda. So at any rate, uh, because you have this bathroom that's a bucket, you don't have any toilet paper. You have to use your fingers. The only way to clean your fingers is to wipe them on the concrete wall. The floor is filthy. We were allowed to clean out the floor with a broom and a bucket of water one time in five years. Okay, so the floor is filthy. The only thing that's not filthy, of course it's filthy, but it's nothing like that floor. You wipe your hands on the floor. Then you're eating bread. You have no way to not use your hands that you just used for your bathroom on your uh, food. So bad things happen when this goes on, all right? You get all kinds of little parasites that come, worms inside of you, okay? To give you an idea of what that means. After two and a half years up there, I moved to a different camp and I've got a commanding officer in this room. His name is Al. And Al is talking to me, and as he's talking to me, a worm he coughs, and a worm comes out of his mouth, about a four-inch worm that I can see. And I grab him, I said, cough again, Al. And he coughs, and I pull this worm out of his mouth. It's about a 12-inch thick worm, like a fishing worm. Okay? He's still coughing and choking, so I say, keep coughing, Al. Tickle your throat, you know, let's even have some more in there. So, he keeps coughing, and to make a long story short, in 15 minutes, I have about a dozen worms in my hand. I'm holding these worms by the middle of their body in my hand. The ends of the worms are wiggling all around. They're all alive. 
They're not earthworks, they're intestinal worms that live inside of you. Okay? So I say, good Al, we got those out there. Okay? Good thing. I said, no, they're not in there anymore. That's good. Meanwhile, I'm thinking in my mind, how the devil do we fight this? How can we fight these things? A little while later, um, another friend of mine, a guy named George, was um, you you had to a lot of Men would die by not eating. They'd give up, they'd quit. They wouldn't eat, they'd die. This happened a number of times. This happened so many times after somebody would complain or tap through the walls and make some complaint or something like that. So everybody learned to never complain. Because you might blow somebody's mind and they may stop eating and die. So you always have to try to be positive. That's why I was positive with Al. Good Al, we got those worms out there. You don't say things like, oh, yuck, stupid worms are so ugly and they're coming out of your mouth, Al. Okay? You can't do that. Okay? You might blow the guy's mind. you gotta, you got to always look for the positive when you're in a situation like that. It really was a place where it was, it was so bad that nobody dared complain. It was way past that. It was a fight for survival, a fight to live, you know, that kind of thing. So at any rate, uh, because so many men had died by not eating, when George didn't eat one morning, he didn't have much food to eat, or he, he wolfed it down. I said, you know, George, you didn't eat, you know. He says, yeah, okay, I'm right. I'll eat this afternoon, but he didn't. Then the next day I said, George, you didn't eat again, you know. He says, well, I, I'm all right, I just, I don't feel like eating. I says, you don't feel like eating? He said, no. I said, but I'll eat this afternoon, but he didn't. The third day I said, George, we gotta talk. We gotta sit down here. We got to talk. And he said, no, I know what you think. It's okay. I'm all right. I said, what do you mean it's all right? You know, you're not eating. You know, and he said, well, I just, I don't feel like eating. I said, what do you mean you don't feel like eating? He said, well, I feel so full, I feel like I can't eat anything. I said, well, it's easy to tip me your throat, you know, and get whatever is in there and out of there. So he tickles his throat. We get a bucket, an empty bucket. The buckets were used for the bathroom. He tickles his throat. He fills this thing up about an inch, inch and a half with thousands of little half-inch worms. Okay? He was so full of intestinal worms that he literally couldn't eat. Okay? He came all the way up his throat. His whole stomach and everything full of these things. Okay? So, these kinds of parasites, and I almost got killed as late as uh, 2001 or so, some almost 30 years afterwards. I got, I, for, for five years, I couldn't move. I, could, I basically had no energy. I couldn't move. I lost five jobs in four years. I couldn't understand what was wrong. Um, you know, 60, 55, 60 years old, I couldn't understand it. You know, I, I just, I had no, I, I was not able to function. Went to doctor after doctor, they couldn't find anything wrong. Finally, I went to a doctor that had really good tests for parasites. I had 11 major parasites in my body. Uh, eight of the 11 were from Southeast Asia only. Two of them were liver flutes. If you've ever seen, if you've ever done a lot of hunting, Invariably, you know, you kill a rabbit or a duck or a coot or something like that, you'll see the liver just seething with worms. Okay, those are liver flutes. That's how my liver was, two different kinds. I also had lung flutes. All over my lungs, these worms were burrow burrowing, and they've been doing it for 30 years, just multiplying. Okay, I had also uh, eight other kinds of parasites. Parasites. Some of you know, two or three of them were the intestines, but the rest of it migrated. They rolled over the body. Those lung flutes were like the trichinosis worms, where they burrow into you, not just your lungs, they go out and get your brain, you get holes in your brain, and all this kind of stuff, okay? So these parasites are really wicked. I, I studied it, and uh, they only lived, the average age you know, when we were over there uh, in Vietnam was 42 years old. And the reason that it was 42 is because most of them live with two or more major parasites their whole adult lives, because they use human manure for their fields without composting. Apparently you can get away with that if you compost it. Well, not if you don't compost it. You get these kind of parasite problems. And that's what we had in ourselves. We really are recycling all kinds of stuff because we weren't able to even clean ourselves after we went to the bathroom. Now, after three months up there, the conditions were so bad that I didn't believe it. I thought, this has got to be some kind of nightmare. i got to wake up from this. This is ridiculous. Okay. And I remember thinking to myself, 
You don't believe this. You don't believe this. And you've lived this for three months. So if you ever get out of here, don't ever get upset with anyone who doesn't understand. How can they possibly understand? How can you tell them what it was like if you lived it for three months, guy, and you don't believe it? That's how it was. The other thing about that time I remember thinking was, well, like as an example, the first week where the, Bob and I were there, we, we thought, we talked, tapped through the walls to somebody. He said he'd been there two or three months. Okay, two or three months. And we, we turned to each other and said, boy, thank God we weren't shut down two or three months ago. How did he ever make, you know, two and a half months? How did he do that? I can't believe he made that. You know, then when we got to be one or two months in, you talked to somebody that had been there six months or a year, it was the same thing. Thank God we're going home before that. It wasn't until a year or two years went by, three years went by, you realized we were never going home. We were going to spend our lives in those conditions. There was no way out. They stopped the bombing in 68 which was the only pressure on the way to Vietnam. And there was just no way out of there. We were the abandoned. We were the ones that had been written off. That was the end of us. We're just going to have to get used to living up there. So that's what we tried to do. My, my cellmate, Bob Craner, when you're in conditions like that, there's a tendency to think about how good it was in the past or how good it's going to be in the future. But you don't think about today. Now, you know, Jesus and the Bible and Catholic faith and the real people that know what they're talking about say, no, 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 no. You don't do that. You think about today, you live the moment. You try to handle what you can. And forget the past, trust God's forgiveness. Forget the future, trust his provision. You just live in the moment, live today. We were doing the exact opposite. When you start doing the exact opposite, for the first time in my life, I got into despair. And so did my cellmate, Bob Craner. But he was seven years older than me and a lot smarter. And what he said was, guy, he says, we're getting too much of this where all we can do is talk about the food that we're going to have when we get out or the way it was or our families, our wives, our children. We've got to cut all that stuff out and just think about what we can do here. And that was your, your, your whole body and mind and soul rejected where you were. You didn't want to, you didn't want to be there in any way, shape, or form. But that's what you had to do. So I said, okay, that's good, Bob. How are we going to do that? He says, well, here's what we'll do. We'll allow ourselves to think about our families for 15 minutes a day. And that's it. We'll make it right as, right as nighttime falls. We'll think about it for 15 minutes. Otherwise, all thoughts of the states, all thoughts of our families are off limits. We'll just work on what we can do here. So that's what we did. I completely turned around our mental state. Kept us from going nuts. I really believe if we hadn't done that, we would have went nuts in the first year. Uh, at, the, at the same time, um, I began to hate very much these people that had been hurting us and hurting my uh, fellow cellmates. I, I began to hate them very much, and I became worse than they were. I, I would think all night long, all day long, about how I'm going to get even, kill them, fight them, beat them, no matter what. I'm going to get every one of them alone, and I'm going to torture them worse than they're torturing me, than anybody ever tortured me. And I'm not going to let them die, just like they wouldn't let us die in the torture. They keep you alive in the torture. You know, they just said, it's just endless pain, 24-7. Torture never stops. So, I'm going to get them like that. I'm going to keep them alive for years in utter agony. And I'd have different tortures lined up for each interrogator and each torture. The way I'm going to get them. Into pure hatred. All of a sudden, I start getting, start getting thoughts. A way to beat these guys, which... The thing that everybody was terrified about is becoming a uh, TV personality for the bad guys, for the communists. Because they can torture you to the point where you memorize the questions and answers, and they put a video camera on you and say, what do you think about the war in Vietnam? And you say, 
oh, I think it's very bad. I think we're making a big mistake. I think the country ought to get out. You know, all this kind of thing. I think it's a big mistake. Or, you know, do you ever attack military targets? No, no. All we do is attack women and children. They told us the best way to break the will of the enemy is to kill all the women and children and all the people. This was their classic line in all their propaganda. So here you are. So people like you, you know, I'm just like you. Put yourself in that position. How'd you like to go on CNN or BBC and tell the whole world, okay, that Iran is really a great country and all we do when we fight them is kill men, women, and children and we shouldn't be fighting them and all this kind of thing. That's the position that we were in. And unfortunately, because of torture, they didn't get you to do that. And they got everybody to do that that I knew that went through it. So I figured it, was, it looked like there was no way to beat it. I did beat it, but only because of prayer. But at any rate, the, it looked like there was no way to beat it. It's a, it's a, a despair type of thing. And so when, when some being puts into your mind the idea that you can beat these guys, all you have to do is go stop eating in the corner. Then they won't be able to use you for propaganda. Unsaid was because you're going to die. So I said, no, I'm not going to do that. Then the thoughts come back stronger and stronger and stronger. It's not me talking, it's something talking to my mind, okay? So I'm sitting there and I'm saying, Lord, of course, I, I believe that I'm on the side of God, justice, and the American way. I'm going to fight these guys. I went to Vietnam to keep the communists off this country. Much better to fight them over there before my wife and kids are in the fight. So if they're going to play their little games, which is to take all these little countries around the world and then close in on us, I'd rather fight them over there than fight them on the borders of this country. So that's why I went over there and I volunteered and everything like that, and I was fighting hard. So basically, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to, I didn't want to get in this position where I was helping them in any way, shape, or form. And suicide looked like the right way, but I knew that that was wrong. So I was wondering, why am I having these thoughts? I couldn't get them out of my mind. All day and all night, I'd be thinking about this suicide. So. I realized, well, it must be because of my hatred. That's the only thing I'm doing different. So I thought, I, I, can't, I can't hate these people. I can't hate these people. I got them. And I, I, real, I remembered from my Catholic school training back in the 50s, and nuns used to say, you know, God is love, Satan is hate. You don't mean Satan with hate. That's his game. It means Satan with love. So no matter what, you don't hate anyone on this earth, okay? You let God handle, sort everything out on Judgment Day. You just love and do the best you can to forgive anybody that hurts you and leave it at that. You're not God. God handles all that. God handles revenge. You don't have anything to do with it. The nuns will drill this into us and so on. So I, and the, little, the catchphrase that came to my mind was, God is love, Satan is hate. And, I, and then I sit there, I have to be honest. I say, my gosh, all I do is hate. Oh, that's what's happened. These voices are from the wrong guys. So I said, I got to stop that. So I tried to stop it. I still wasn't praying, praying every day. I wasn't praying every day or anything like that. I'd been going to daily mass all through the academy and all through combat because I knew that when I went to daily mass, everything worked great. And it was beautiful days and you know, very great peace. But I, but, I, but I didn't have a good personal prayer life. I wasn't praying in prison camp. So I, I basically uh, couldn't stop. I had no way. Without prayer, I had no way to stop the hatred. It just got worse and worse. So finally, I realized, Lord, help me. Mary, help me. You've got to help me. I've got to stop this. I realized by now that I'm in terrible danger of committing suicide because of the, the, the arguments and the voices get stronger and stronger. So I, I started praying the rosary, praying the rosary, praying the rosary. And almost immediately, I had the thought, You've got to forgive these people, and you've got to pray for them, and you've got to pray that they get to heaven. Okay? And when I had that thought, I remember thinking, Lord, you've got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me. But I realized he wasn't kidding me. I had to forgive these people. So I prayed rosary after rosary. I was telling Dan that I was up to five, 15 deck of rosaries a day. Did that for month after month after month. After three months, for the first time, I could form in my mind the words, Lord, please forgive them. I hope they get to heaven. But I didn't mean it. It wasn't sincere.
But after three more months, I can say, Lord, I forgive them. I know they're your children. I know you love them as much as you love me. I'm praying that they get that. I forgive them completely. And started a great time of peace and joy in my life the next three and a half years in prison camp. Now, we didn't know we were going to only be there five years. It looked like we were going to be there the rest of our lives. And I would have been joyful and happy for the rest of my life in a communist prison camp. By this time, God showed me that he was totally in charge of every detail of life. There is zero coincidence. And I saw that he was totally in charge in a communist prison camp, which when you're in a cell locked up and you're under those conditions, I never would have believed that until I experienced it. But believe me, he was in charge. To give you an idea of the kinds of things that happen to me all the time, I'm in an interrogation. The guy says to me, I'm the first guy in. We've got no guidance from our commanders through the wall of how to handle the interrogation sequence. They have the same, they ask the same questions to everybody. You know, they got everybody isolated. They ask the same questions. It's like they're bureaucrats and they have a list of things to ask and what they want to get out of your propaganda wise. They ask these same questions. So I, I was the first guy in. I had no guidance from the commanders. We always handled everything just the way the commanders told us. I was a junior guy. I was one of the youngest, one of the two youngest guys in prison camp. So at any rate, uh, the guy says to me, uh, you should be very thankful to the government for feeding you. You know, most of your friends are all dead. Uh, you know, you, you've been kept alive. You know, you have uh, food. We give you food. You know, but you're a war criminal. You should be killed right away. But you're still alive, so you should be very thankful to the government for feeding you. I said, I thank God for my food. You know, God gives me the food. You know, your brother gets it from the people, but, you know, God gives me the food. I thank God for my food. No, no God. No God. There is no God. God gives you the food, et cetera, et cetera. I said, look, the government doesn't have any weather. It doesn't have rain. It doesn't have any soil. It doesn't have any seeds. Did your government make a seed? All this is from God. God grows the food. And your government takes it from the people that grow the give to us, which is nice. They give us some food, so we're alive. But it's not the government giving us food, it's God giving us food. No, 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 no. This goes on and on. This is a 15-minute discussion with this interrogator. By this time, I know that God is, is totally in charge and he really is there. So I figured, this is great. You know, I understand, boy. You're really there. You're very, very good at disguising that so that everybody has free choice. But you're really in charge of everything. So I said, well, I'm just going to tell everybody that you're really here. There is no coincidence. If it's anything bad, you allow it, and you bring some good out of it, like the crucifixion. I understand that. I see what's going on. You really are in charge. So I'm going to tell everybody, and everybody's going to know. And then everybody's going to be obeying the Ten Commandments, taking care of each other. It's going to be one big happy family on earth. Like you want, I can see how it's going to work. That's great. So, everybody believes me. I don't lie. So I'm going to just tell everybody, God is really there. He's totally powerful. All this other stuff is just a joke. It's just a test. It's just a little test for us. Test to see how we do on a daily basis. So, I'm going to start this evangelization with this interrogator. So, that's what I'm doing. I'm telling them, you know, that you know, God really is in charge of the food. He's in charge of this. He's taking care of us, not the government. So he doesn't like this. After a while, I'm saying things to him like, look, look, don't you understand? You're going to die. And when you die, you're going to be at that side of that table, and God's going to be at this side. Jesus Christ is going to be across the table from you. Okay? And he's going to have everything that you've ever done on that table. He's going to go through one after the other. You know, he's in there. He's got your history exactly. Every thought you've had and how you react to it. But that's what's going to happen to you. And there's going to be no pilot bureau, no government at the table. It's going to be up to him. And if, you, if you're not sorry for killing my buddies, torture us, okay? If you, before you die, then you're going to go to hell and burn really bad forever. That's what's going to happen. That's the truth, okay? Face it. So he goes nuts. Of course, I'm not a good evangelizer. I'm not a priest. I'm not a nun. I know nothing, all right? I don't know anything. So this is not the right way to convince people that they're wrong. You know, to basically 
grab me by the throat verbally, you know, and try to browbeat him. But anyway, that's what I try to do. He goes nuts. He has his thugs come in. They put me out to a hot room, one of their hot room tortures in the summertime. As I'm leaving, he's bouncing off the wall and screaming over and over again, I will show you, you will have nothing without the government. Do you hear me? Nothing, nothing, nothing without the government. So I go out to the a little uh, hot box there. The guards bring me out there. They can't understand a word of English. They don't know what he's saying. And they open the hatch of the hot box and you step into to get in there. This is like 11 in the morning in August. So it's really hot. And the hot box is much, much hotter than the outside. So I'm climbing in the hot box. As I'm climbing in, one of the guards picks up a piece of stiff cardboard, fans himself with it, and gives it to me. First, only time it happened in five years. So he gives me the, but he gives me a fan. I go in a hot box, I have a fan. I'm supposed to have nothing, but now I have a fan. Okay. So I'm in a hot box, and I'm on my knees. I close the hatch. I'm on my knees. The fan's on the ground. I don't care about the fan. I am so happy that God gave me that sign because of my pathetic attempt at evangelizing this poor interrogator. I figured probably I drove him away from Christianity forever. He'll never become a Christian now because I'm such a jerk in the way I tried to talk to him. But thank you, God. Apparently, you're still with me because God was all I had. That's it, man. That's the only help I had. So thank you, Lord. I'm, over, I'm on my knees saying over and over again, thank you, God. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, God. Thank you, Mary. Just literally like that. Big smile on my face. Tears of joy rolling down my face. I could have been happier. I'm doing that for five minutes, just thanking God that he hasn't deserved me. And at that time, I hear thunder in the distance. Within a half an hour, there's a thunderstorm over the prison camp. Two inches of rain falls. Cools that in a hot box. And they take me out. That's not a torture anymore. <laughs> they take me out and put me on my knees, but that's nothing like being in that hot box. So, he beat that for me. He beat all kinds of torches for me. He beat it without me even having any real trouble. That was a, that was, that was nothing. Then a, a little while later, they had, they decided to go after me to meet a delegation. And the way they do that is they have, first have you read, they have a 15 minute boom box that can be heard in the camp. And they have 15 minutes of propaganda on how they're winning the war in South Vietnam. And they do that every day and it's, it's their, newspaper, which is total lies, and they have, they can't speak English very well, they have an American POW read it, okay, so then after the guy agrees to read it, they get a reading that for a while, then they have to tell them that they're going to have meet a delegation, most of these delegations, which are like communist sympathizing delegations, were from, the, from Europe, the European countries, but some of them were from the United States too. These guys would come over there thinking a communist or nice and we're being mean to fight in Vietnam and all this kind of stuff. So, you know, it's typical, typical misestimation of what communism is. Anyway, um, so they had, they had this uh, uh, effectively uh, a way to lead you in to meet the delegations, which effectively makes you a traitor to the United States. And it starts by just innocuously reading news on the radio. So, they, so the camp commander calls me and he says, Ruders, you, know, you have a chance here to write your family. I have not been allowed to write my family. I've been two and a half years up there. They wouldn't let you receive any letters. They wouldn't give your wife any news that you were alive or dead. Like I said, it was only one in seven guys that uh, were alive, and they wouldn't tell the wives who was alive and who was dead. They wouldn't even do that for them. Typical communism. And to us, they wouldn't let us know that our wives were, you know, they tell our tells our wives and you know married somebody else and all this kind of stuff. So anyway, this is just their typical little game. So one of their pros on this thing is that, well, we're gonna let you write a letter home and tell your family that you're alive and all you have to do is read on the radio, you read the news on the radio and stuff like that. I said, well, I understand, but I don't want to read on the radio. Oh, but you know, it's a camp coming, it's a it's a Order of the camp commander, so you have to read on the radio. Yeah, I understand. I understand. 
well, you know, if you don't read on the radio, then, you know, you must be punished. Yeah, I understand, I have to be punished. Well, then, you know, why don't you read on the radio? Because I don't, I don't read on the radio. Okay, well, you must be punished then. So they put you in the ropes, the little rope torture. The little rope torture is, is they tie your elbows and touch you behind your back with about five guys doing that. It's not easy to do that, which dislocates one of your shoulder. Your elbows are tightly tied together behind your back now, and you're on your knees. You got leg irons real tight on your ankles, ankle irons, and they take a rope from the rope behind you, between your hands, and they bend you backward until your knees are just about touching the back of your ankles, and you're in a pretzel type position. All the everything in your body is being stretched like crazy, so it's extremely agonizing and so So that's their little persuader there, and they can just leave you there. They don't have to beat you or anything like that. They come and beat you now and then with bamboo clubs, but. The real pain is from those, from the stretching of the ropes. So I'm there for about eight hours in the ropes, and they call me back to the before the nighttime comes when they leave you at home. They call me back to the camp commander. The camp commander says, "You, you don't want to read on the radio. You don't want." To. And so I said, "No, I still don't want to read on the radio." But you know, why don't you want to read on the radio? I said, "Because it would disgrace my family." He says. They just take them back. So they put me back in the ropes. About an hour later, they come and get me and put me back in my cell. So Bob says, did you read on the radio? I said, no. He said, well, what, what happened? Why did you get out of there? Because you did it. You didn't get out of there. You know, it took three, four, five days went by and you finally gave up and said, all right, all right, I'll read on the radio. So and if you don't do it after three or four days, they hang you up by your elbows from a fan hook. So you're hanging by your elbows behind your back, okay? That's a beautiful torture. The longest I knew anybody lasted under that one was 13 days, 13 days and nights, okay? You hang yourself by your elbows behind your back. Everything is just pulled loose. So at any rate, you know, they brought me back to myself. So I never even had to read on the radio. So the only reason that happened was I was praying very hard, and I didn't have any idea about this would disgrace my family or anything. God put those words in my mouth and saved me from the torture. Because they have great feelings for family over there. They really do. And this guy apparently was a good family man. And he understood what I was saying. Oh, he didn't, he didn't pursue it. And I, as far as I know, I, I mean, I don't know anybody else that got out of that. And I'm, you know, I saw 40 guys go through that. So, at any rate, he saved me from that. He did this over and over again. So my greatest fear, which was to be a traitor on TV or a videotape, you know, telling some, uh, you know, pro-communist delegation that the United States is wrong in being in the fight and so on, that greatest fear, which I thought there was, it looked like there was no way to be beaten, uh, no way to stop it, no way to get out of it, was won by Mary, the rosary, by God. God, let me not do that because of him. Nothing to do with what I was doing. He let that, he let that happen. So uh, it was a number of things like that that gave me a great, great confidence and a great feeling in God. I realized I had no power of my own, that everything in life was really up to God, and that the right way to handle it is to be his child. And since I got out, you know, I've been going, I'm so happy to get to confession and mass. There was no mass or confession or anything for those five years in prison camp. Since I got out, I go to daily mass. I'm going to monthly confession. And, you know, I just don't miss it. I flew for the airlines for 17 years with Eastern Airlines. I'd get in at, a, you know, 10, 12, 1 in the morning. And the first thing I did at the hotel was before cell phones and before GPS and all that stuff, I'd call up the local churches. I'd ask at the hotel, we they put us up at a hotel by the airport. I'd ask where the closest church was and what their mass times were. I'd hire a taxi from the hotel. We had no cars, we'd fly the airliners around all day. You know, we'd fly airliners around 12, 14, 16 hours every day on these three day trips. So I'd call, I'd get a taxi, have the taxi take me to the local church for the daily mass at 6 in the morning or 7 in the morning or 8 in the morning, wherever it was, no matter when we got in, and come back and get more sleep if I could. Never tried to never miss mess, miss mess. Okay. He he got me through all life. We had five more kids after I got back, so we had seven kids. We've been 
been married 48 years. All the kids are doing good. They've all gone through college. You know, I've got enough money because of him uh, to get the kids through college and so on, which is a tough little game today. Still paying off all kinds of debt, but you know, the kids are, the kids are thrilling, the kids are doing okay. So basically, and it was impossible. I mean, I can tell you, I can stand here for, you know, 10 hours and tell you how we got me these jobs and how I go into hopeless jobs like IBM salesman where I was a, a new guy out of 23 sales and they gave me the most hopeless account in the country, which was a Western Electric AT&T account in Newark, New Jersey. It was hopeless. I was losing $2 million of revenue for IBM that year, and they gave it to me because they dumped it on the new guy so that I starved to death, you know, on negative commissions for at least two or three years, right? Well, after six months, I got out of that account because of him, because of Lord Daily Mass, and saying, you know, full 15 deck of rosary every day on the way to and from work in Newark. I got the largest sale in IBM history by a single sale of $48 million. And he did that in everything I did. Okay? Every job I went to would be hopeless. And I, I do good at it. And it was all God. I know it's all God. I'm giving all the to God. I don't have any power in my own. And I know that. All I'm trying to say is, is that if you go to the Daily Mass, the one thing, if you can just go to the Daily Mass, at least in the morning, thank your guardian angel for being there for another day. And ask him to run your day. Say the hour of Father, if you can just do that in the morning, you're in great shape. But try to go to daily mass if you can. Try to go to confession. One other thing, you know, I got had uh, drinking problems. I got had uh, uh, drinking problems, smoking problems. I got those problems, okay? And you try to beat those on your own, you can't beat them on your own. They're tough to beat. You know, you got Satan in there. It's, it's too much strength in a smoker. You're, you got real evil with you. Just like that hatred, it's the same kind of thing. But you can beat it all when you use confession. Okay? You just go to confession every week. So here I am. I didn't want to stop smoking in any way, shape, or form. So I go to confession. I say, Lord, I want to stop smoking. Or I don't want to stop smoking. Please help me. Please give me the grace to stop smoking. You know, I'm going to tell a priest, I'm doing this, I'm, I'm doing all the smoke. I'm two and a half packs of candles every day. I'm smoking all this. Cigarettes and it's killing, killing me, and my family's gonna, my kids are gonna be left without a father. So, he said, All right, you're a the song for your penance, so song. And then next week, I go to the bed. I still, I still don't want to quit smoking. I do that three or four weeks in a row. After three or four weeks in a row, <coughs> just like hatred in North Vietnam, but instead of six months, it's three or four weeks, all of a sudden, I want to stop smoking. Okay? And I stop. And I haven't smoked for, you know, 23 years. I don't want anyone to touch it. Okay? Same with the drink. I want to have a glass of wine. I want to have a glass of champagne. My daughter just got married. My youngest daughter, you know, 26 years old, just got married. Big wedding, you know, all this kind of stuff. Okay, I didn't touch champagne. I didn't touch wine. I never missed it. Okay? Why? The grace of God through confession. Okay? So, I'm just saying that that's there for you. Now, what, I'm, I'm, what happens is, what happens to me is, you think you can beat this stuff on your own? Tell me, you can't. It's what all spiritual writers in our church say. You've got to have the grace of God to improve spiritually. And when you have a bad habit, no matter what it is, that's a spiritual problem. Bad habit. When you're killing your body, it's a bad habit. So that's a spiritual problem. You don't beat spiritual problems without God's help. Why? Because He really is our Father. And He wants you to acknowledge that you're His child. Okay? He wants you to ask him for help. And if you don't, you keep learning the hard way. And it's a tough game. But I'm just trying to tell that to you. So if you find yourself in that situation, not so much now. Now you're, you're really protected spiritually by your parents and your families and everything like that. But boy, it gets really tough out there. And when it gets tough, there's an easy way out. Go to confession every week. Whether it's you know, drinking, smoking, or anything else and uh, stop it that way and like I say it's a lot easier to stop these sins like it took me six months heavy heavy prayer to stop hatred you can stop hatred and all quicker than that in confession so at any rate that's about the, uh, the things that I wanted to cover tonight and I'll be happy to answer any questions Yeah, go ahead. 
He made it back, but he died at 44 of a massive heart attack uh, when he came back from overseas, and he got it on. Uh, he was a good athlete. He got it in a full court basketball game. He was eight years in the Eastern European uh, countries in Czechoslovakia and Hungary as an air attaché. He came back after 80 years without any real exercise. He, he got in a full court basketball game in D.C. and collapsed the heart attack on, on the floor at 44. He was a colonel by that time. And we went up to his funeral, and I've been in touch with his kids ever since. But, you know, he made it back to the prison camp. Yeah. Um, were you involved at Wright-Patterson at the Air Force Base? They have, like, the cells, the imitation of the cell. Yeah, the cell, yeah, yeah. So that cell is uh, my, uh, a good friend of mine, Ed McEnroe, who's one of my classmates, class of 64 at the Air Force Academy, is the guy that ran that project. Okay? I'll tell you, I'll tell you a funny story about that. You know, that's what you do is you tap through the walls, see? You tap through the walls. So there you can you can hear it, you can hear the tapping. Now we tap for the first years, for the first four years we tap. Three years from the end of the war, somebody figured out that you could take this tin cup, you could muffle it with your hands, and you could talk in one side of a you know 12 to 18 inch concrete wall, as long as you found a rock that went all the way through. And you could talk in a low voice through that wall. The guy with his ear on the other side of the wall could hear you talking. Then we didn't have to tap anymore. Okay? The way we tap is you took the alphabet, threw out K. You got 26 letters in the alphabet. You throw out K. Now you got 25. If you want to tap a K, you use C. So C can be a C or a K, right? So then you tap the row and column of each letter. You, you, you arrange your letters A, D, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, no K, L, N, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. If I want to tap out Z, I tap out 5, 5, fifth row, fifth column. If I want to tap out A, that's first row, first column. B is C is high, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, okay? So it's two, three, two, four. So I go, if I want to say high, I say high. That's a word. The, guy on the, other, the guy's on the wall on the other side. He goes, got the word. Of course, this is very likely because the guards are always listening to the wall because they know what we're doing because of the torture. They, you know, they know what we're doing, but they, 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 they never could stop us because we, we cleared a million different ways and you know, gave each other a way to do it. Right? But if the guy didn't copy it, if he, if he didn't understand the word, he'd go, I didn't get it. I'd retransmit. Got it. Boom. Next word to me for me. Okay? And you do like that. You get very fast at that. Everybody here knows it. It's text messaging, right? You start using abbreviations like crazy. Okay. Like you sign off with GBU. God bless you. You know, that was your standard sign off in the prison games. Okay. And so, you know, but app is so much quicker when you're talking. Instead of texting, you know, effectively texting or tapping, you're talking. Now you can talk using your cups, okay? So Communication was a tremendous part of being able to make it. We had an organization, we, we kept tight discipline, tight military discipline, in absolutely hopeless conditions. <laughs> okay. it, was, it was really, really, really something to say. It was really, really pretty good. I, I was so impressed. Remember, I was a junior officer. I was, a, I was so impressed with the 35 and 40 year olds who, when I first got shot down, you know, we were physically being smashed so hard. I figured these guys were never going to make a month. You know, I mean, you, I was a boxer, and, you know, judo guy. And we were number two in the nation in judo, and I was first trained. And, you know, I was a really good boxer and all that kind of stuff. I could really take punishment, right? You get beat with rifle butts and so on, you know, really hard. Guys really hit you hard with rifle butts. It really takes it out of you. So I just couldn't understand, and I was in super shape, like 24 years old. I was running six miles every night around the time. I could do, you know, 150 push-ups at a time and all this kind of stuff. So basically, um, 
you know, I couldn't understand how these guys, 35 and 40, were, were making it, were living, literally, how are they living? But what I learned was, is the spirit trumps the physical. You know, they had God. You know what I mean? When you're, you know, when you're 24, you think it's you. You think I'm God. You know, by the time you're 30 or 35, you're, you've been through the school of hard knocks, and you know that it's God. These guys were really religious guys. You know, they were a lot of them were Protestants, a lot of them were Catholic, but a lot of them were Protestants. But they were uniformly really good Christians, and boy, they were iron up there. They were steel. It was wonderful. We had great leadership. Lord help you. When you have really good leadership like that, it is such a pleasure. You know, it is such a, a blessing. It's just like, since that time I've been out of the military and I've been in a number of companies where they didn't have good leadership, and it's so, you know, discouraging. You know? Any other questions? Yes. We were free because really of one man who was President Nixon made a decision when they wouldn't release us in 1972 here. He started a Christmas bombing on his order with the Congress out of session. And he says, hit them hard. Hit them hard until they get our POWs free. And one of the very interesting things that I have, and I'm so lucky, okay, my brother was four years behind me at the Air Force Academy. And when he graduated, he went right to Vietnam and volunteered for Vietnam. And he was a combat pilot. And he was shot down three times. And each time, rescued. And he kept fighting, and he never came home. He tried to, you know, he was supposed to only serve a year over there, or, you know, a tour. He wouldn't go home. And he just stayed. He stayed there the whole time, because I was in prison camp. So. And in the last, in that Christmas bombing, which got us out there, he was a pilot on the B-52s that bombed us out of there over half a mile. My brother, you know. So, his name is Terry, Terry Bruce. So he just stayed over there, you know, he's a no-kidding guy. Like the men around here. Got great soldiers from this area, you know. Great soldiers. We're so lucky, you know, that we got the Midwest and the South. We're so lucky. This country is so lucky. That's why we're free. Yes, God. 73. They, were, they bombed us out in Christmas of 72. We actually got out of there. I got out of there in March of 73. They released us in four releases, three releases, four releases, but one release was a minor release in uh, February and March of 1973. Okay. How old are you now? Now I'm uh, six, 69 years old. 69. Eating when you're eating when you're eating, you can only do so much against those guys. 
because they're eating on me from the inside, you know. And they finally got to a point where I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. I lost five jobs in four years. I couldn't do anything. And then I finally found a doctor that knew, that understood parasites. And he tested me for them, and he gave me the Latin names of the 11 that I had. He said, I've got terrible infestations of all 11. And he told me how to kill them. The way you kill them is with uh, Nature Sunshine has a, a parasite cure. It's based, it's the same 500, or it's, it's the same cure as China's used for 4,000 years against parasites. Because they do the same thing. See, they use that human manure that's not compostable. So they have the same problem. Okay. So they have, uh, and so they developed, you know, there's 500 different herbs of this parasite cure, which gets every known parasite, gets every parasite in the world. So he gave me this parasite cure. Two weeks on, one week off. That lets the eggs all hatch. The eggs are all over your body. The one week off lets the eggs all hatch. Then you take another cure, another two week. Two, it's just a simple tablet, there's nothing to it. And then you, that kills all those guys. And then just for insurance, I did a third cycle. I took a week off and then I did a third cure. I went back for testing and the test showed I was clear of all parasites. Only took three weeks. Anybody who deals with animals or anything like that, or is any, you know, I recommend that Nature Sunshine is only fourteen dollars for a two-week cure. You know, and then you don't you don't have any parasites. I'm not clear on the situation on how how you felt physically, mentally, whatever right before they found out that you did have this parasite. Just imagine that you can't do anything. You can't. You it's 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 agony to get out of bed. You have. Zero energy. These things are burrowing in your brain. The worst thing is your liver is full of worms, literally. And your liver, you know, handles everything. It's a filter for all your blood, and it's not working. So you're just so discouraged. Your, your mind is not working good. Your brain is not working good. You can't even think. You can't remember anything. Nothing works. The whole body is shut down, and you don't know why. And I went for all kinds of tests, like they you know, put stuff down my throat, up my fanny, and did every blood test in the world, and they could, they, they, because nobody expects parasites in this country, you know. Just don't, you just, they don't, they don't have, now my brother worked in a lab, and he said the reason they don't expect it, because he always comes back negative, because he worked in a lab that tested for him down at the upper floor, and he said nobody would put the stool samples under the microscopes. <sighs> okay. That nobody wanted to get dirty enough to take the poop, you know, to take poop, put it under a microscope. Nobody in the lab tested for these things. Would take the, you know, these were three other guys. He was the only guy out of four that would put the poop under the slide and look for parasites. The rest of them just put negative, negative, negative. So that's why, it's, that's one reason there's not a lot of parasites. It was around 2000, 2001. About 27 years I had these things built. But I mean, for five years, I had been helpless. I, didn't, I just couldn't do anything. I couldn't do anything. Yes? How were you treated by the American people when you came home? Great. Treated great. The average soldier wasn't. But the POWs were everybody's friend. Everybody's, everybody felt so sorry for us, you know. We were treated great. We really were. The Americans united behind treating us great. Yeah? I just want to thank you. Well, you're welcome. I, I, I thank everybody here. I know probably a lot of you guys are in service. I thank you for your service. Service is a service. It doesn't matter. You're under discipline. That's it. Okay. Did, you, did you have a question? Yeah. Okay. Oh. All right. I guess, I guess we'll, we'll head on over to the teen room for a little reception. So you're all welcome to come over. And like I said, you know, just give the, the guys a quick <laughs>